Prince Charles, at one time the most sought-after bachelor in the world. Quite a lot of young ladies thought they might fancy themselves as queen. He certainly made the most of his playboy image. Here was the action man prince, and here were a list of very glamorous young women in his company. As heir to the throne, the future of the monarchy was in his hands. Charles had one task, to find the wife who would become the future queen of England and who would produce an heir. And his choice of wife, paramount. They didn't want any scandal, they didn't want any shame. But his journey has been far from smooth. He was regarded as being a bit of a liability because he was in and out of too many beds. Time was ticking and the world was watching to see who he'd choose. From a romance with his future sister-in-law. I think Sarah would have been right up there as a possible bride. And a marriage proposal to his second cousin. He knew that she would be a suitable match. It would have been a dynastic marriage that pleased everyone. How hard was it to find the perfect bride? How would the monarchy look today if he had chosen differently? And what was it about these women that made them serious contenders? Heartache, infidelity, and romance. These are the women who could have been queen. Prince Charles is now the paragon of wedded bliss after tying the knot with second wife Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, in 2005. Charles and Camilla's relationship today is serious, committed, stable, and a loving partnership. I think he was always in, in love with Camilla. He needed her companionship in his life, and he wasn't happy until he had it. Whilst the title Camilla will take is still a cause for debate, one is for sure. When Charles finally accedes to the throne, she will be by his side. But Charles's search to find his future queen has been far from easy. Before marrying his first wife, Lady Diana Spencer, the prince spent over a decade hunting for the right woman. Prince Charles found it very easy to find girlfriends to have fun with. He found it very difficult to find a young lady who he could actually marry. Charles set himself a deadline age 30 to marry. He always knew he would be under immense pressure to choose the perfect bride. In a 1969 interview, he spoke passionately about the challenges of finding her. In my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think, who, who could fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from him, from, uh, almost from childhood, that the chief task of his life was to carry on the dynasty successfully, so he had to get the right woman. There were strict criteria that any potential bride would have to meet. You needed to be aristocratic, able to gain the approval of the queen herself, not a Catholic, not divorced, and an actual virgin. It was an absolute necessity that Charles should marry someone who had not had any other relationships with men. The phrase was she had to be Virgo these requirements were being placed on Charles in the 70s, in the age of the sexual revolution. I think it's probably right to say that in Charles's social circle, virgins were about as rare as mermaids. Charged with an almost impossible task, Charles's search was also set to play out under the watchful eye of the world's media. All he needed to do was walk across a polo lawn with a woman and suddenly she was named in the press as his current girlfriend, future wife, future queen. Whilst dozens of women hit the headlines, who were the most notable to win Charles's affections and which of them were closest to becoming queen consort? Rumoured first love Lucia Santa Cruz was introduced to the shy 20-year-old prince at Cambridge University by former politician and the master of Trinity College, R.A. Butler. Lucia was working for Rab Butler, helping him with his memory and his research. She was the daughter of the Chilean ambassador. I think Lucia was someone to who anyone would be attracted. You know, beautiful brunette, I think quite petite, but an absolute, you know, a brain. She was about five years older than Charles. She was very worldly. She spoke several languages. She had her own life. And according to everyone, Charles was immediately smitten. With this amazing young woman, Charles was said to have embarked on his very first love affair. 
It was a physical relationship because um, Rab Butler's wife has said <laughs> rather oddly that um, Charles had been able to cut his teeth on, <laughs> on Lucia, which is a horrible way of putting it. But I think basically what she was saying was that, you know, she was sexually experienced and that was a good thing for Charles. He was a complete innocent. He was younger than his age, and this was true in a sexual sense as well. He'd had no early experience of women. I think his eyes opened to the great possibilities that there were out there. Whilst Lucia is regarded by many as Prince Charles' first serious girlfriend, was she ever a contender for Queen? Lucia could never have been a serious contender for marriage with Charles. I mean, A, Charles was simply too young, and I, you know, doubt she'd have been interested. But of course, there was... She was Catholic as heir to the throne and the future head of the Church of England. He could not marry a Roman Catholic, so Lucia was never going to be in the running because of that. As future king, Charles would have to favour duty over passion. It's said that Lucia still remains good friends with Charles to this day, and it's widely reported that she even played matchmaker for his next serious relationship with Camilla Shand, one that would ultimately change the course of his life. She was living in the same block of flats as Camilla and said to Charles, you know, you have to meet this girl. She's, you know, the, almost the perfect person for you. Camilla was everything that Lucia was and more because she was English, she knew the royal family, she moved in the same circles, and she had the same strength, the same motherly qualities that uh, Lucia had, but she had them, you know, to an even greater extent. She's quite bold, quite racy sense of humour. She's not shy at all. If you're Prince Charles, who's a bit more sort of introverted, Camilla's qualities are extremely alluring. Plus, she's tough, and I think he likes strong women. Camilla's family history also featured a scandalous royal love affair that she was said to have enjoyed telling Charles about when they first met. She said, my great-grandmother was mistress to your great-great-grandfather, Edward VII. So how about it? Meaning, why don't we do the same thing? You can easily imagine Camilla saying that and meaning it with a laugh. Camilla completely took over him physically, mentally, emotionally. I think there's no question that Charles's love for Camilla was greater than, than her for him. Her heart, I think, at that stage was really given to Andrew Parker Bowles. She was always more attracted to Andrew. Andrew was much sexier because he didn't have this slightly sort of vulnerable, weak, uh, timid uh, character that Charles had. But in the summer of 1972, whilst Andrew Parker Bowles was away for six months of army service, Charles and Camilla enjoyed a romance. She knew that Andrew Parker Bowles had been serially unfaithful to her and had carried on with all of other women, including many of her own friends. And this was a bit of payback on Camilla's part. And, and boy, uh, what a person to pay back um, your erring boyfriend with, and the, the heir to the throne. Despite his depth of feeling, Charles didn't propose to Camilla at this time. But would she have been a suitable contender for future queen consort had he followed his heart? Never mind the questions of Charles's age and Camilla's affection for Andrew Parker Bowles, there was one other huge problem. Camilla, who'd been around on the dating scene for several years, might just have been a little too racy for royal taste at that time. Camilla's great as a family. In late 1972, Charles and Camilla's short-lived relationship was placed on hold when the prince's naval obligations led to a tour of duty in the Caribbean. But Charles was to be left heartbroken by Camilla's next move. A week before Andrew and Camilla married, Charles begged her to call it off, but it was too late. Whilst on a tour of duty in the Caribbean, Prince Charles learnt that Camilla Shand and Andrew Parker Bowles were engaged to be married. Charles was devastated, desperately upset. About a week before Andrew and Camilla married, Charles begged her to call it off but it was too late. Just after Charles heard that Camilla was engaged to Andrew Parker Bowles, he also heard that Princess Anne had become engaged. After losing Camilla and then seeing his much-loved younger sister Anne marrying Captain Mark Phillips, I think he did begin to put pressure on himself to try and find a suitable bride. Charles didn't have to wait. 
Armstrong. A week after Anne's wedding, he attended a shooting holiday in Spain, hosted by family friend Arthur Wellesley, the 8th Duke of Wellington. Here, sparks flew for Charles with a true blue blood. Uh, Lady Jane Wellesley uh, was the daughter of the Duke of Wellington, one of our most distinguished and noblest families. She was a, a very attractive, spirited young woman. She was a journalist, so she was somebody who was independent-minded, wanted to be a career woman, making her own in the world. No, I'm buying my own lunch. Are you? She and Charles seemed very well matched. I think he did think about her as a serious prospect at that time. Many people thought that she was a huge contender to be the future queen. 22-year-old Jane's eligibility didn't go unnoticed by the press. She was the first young woman associated with Charles that the press picked up on as a possible future princess. They were followed everywhere and she was followed everywhere. She just found the pressure too much to bear. There was a huge amount of press and media speculation, which actually led her to finally snap, understandably, and say, on the record, do you honestly believe that I want to be queen? This was a problem with many of the aristocratic women that Charles dated. They didn't yearn to be the wife of the heir to the throne because they were already titled. She was already Lady Jane. Why would she choose that when, you know, the downside was that for the rest of her life, the press would follow her everywhere. They'd criticize anything she happened to say inadvertently. It would be a nightmare, and she knew that. As an eligible bachelor, actually his role as prince was off-putting for lots of women. Had the press not helped to scupper this perfect match, how much different would the monarchy have looked today? I think Jane Wellesley would have been a very good queen, as it happens. I think she was sensible, she was intelligent, she was modest. She would have brought to the whole business of being queen much more than Diana did. She was a ticking bomb from the very word go. It was now 1974, and Charles' great-uncle, Lord Mountbatten, had a piece of advice for the 25-year-old prince. Mountbatten was urging Charles specifically that a young man should sow as many wild oats as possible before marriage, but that he should then marry a sweet, innocent girl so she can remain on a pedestal. It certainly looks like he did take that advice. Charles was incredibly close to Mountbatten, and he became one of the biggest influences on the prince's love life. I think Charles did have a, a bit of a fractious relationship with his own father, the Duke of Edinburgh. So I think his uncle provided him with just a lot of friendship and a lot of support. He advised Charles in a very loving, but also very calculating way. He was very much on the dynastic make, and he saw Charles as someone whom he could influence. It helped cement his connection with the royal family. He'd always interfered in, in royal life and had been doing it for many years. Decades before, Mountbatten had really tried to orchestrate the marriage of his nephew, Prince Philip, with Princess Elizabeth, the heiress to England. Now, that marriage, of course, happened but not without Prince Philip actually warning his uncle to back off. Nevertheless, he was the mentor in Charles's life, and it was his advice that Charles decided to follow. Dickie Mountbatten was so supportive of Prince Charles's erotic adventures that he offered him the use of his own property, Broadlands, as a secret love nest or hideaway for Prince Charles to take his girlfriends didn't find it difficult to attract these young ladies. By the mid-70s, his public image had undergone something of a transformation. He was always under pressure from his father, Prince Philip, to be a real man, to be a sort of James Bond figure, almost. So he got the Aston Martin, he did military service, he learned to fly helicopters. He was a good horseman, he was good at playing polo, he had a good figure. It looked very good in white riding breeches. He would take his shirt off and he looked pretty fit in many ways. He wanted to be someone who put himself on the edge of danger, and that sort of... Run a string of romances ensued, but in 1976, just two years away from his self-imposed marriage deadline, one particular lady hit the headlines. Davina Sheffield was the ex-debutante granddaughter of wealthy industrialist Lord McGowan. She was well-connected, cousin of Samantha Cameron. She was, you know, a good rider. She was very good-looking. 
often the women Charles went out with were dubbed Charlie's angels, and she was said to be the most attractive out of all of these Charlie's angels. Charles was said to have wooed Davina away from her boyfriend and could not disguise his love for her, even in public. She was thought to be somebody that Charles took really very, very seriously indeed, and that this was a real meeting of souls as well as bodies. Uh, this was a viable enterprise and that she might be the one that, that he actually chose. But it wasn't long before the relationship came to a sudden end. The story of Davina Sheffield and Charles was the story of, of several young women and Charles. At the time, there were rumours that Charles might propose to her. Her ex-boyfriend was pursued by the tabloids and wound up revealing that he and Davina had lived together, lived in sin, as it was put. And the moment that this emerged, it killed the romance between Charles and, and Davina Sheffield. And that is a pattern that kept on happening. Davina didn't fit into the criteria of the perfect woman, as dictated by the royal firm. But had she and Charles married, we would perhaps have a very different monarchy today. Davina Sheffield wasn't actually an aristocrat of the ancient blue-blooded type. She was descended from industrialists, so her wealth was relatively new money. If she'd married into the royal family, she would have brought in some of the freshness and entrepreneurialism that surrounds industrialism. She would be quite a breath of fresh air, much as Meghan was supposed to be when she married Harry. There's scope in the monarchy for blowing away some of the cobwebs. As his 29th birthday approached, Charles felt an increasing sense of urgency to get married, and his next significant relationship saw a return to a woman of breeding. Like Lady Jane before her, Lady Sarah Spencer hailed from elite aristocracy, two-year-old daughter of the eighth Earl Spencer. She was also Diana's older sister. Lady Sarah Spencer came from exactly the correct lineage to marry Prince Charles. Sarah, from an early age, had been brought up on the edge of the Sandringham estate. Even her grandmothers were ladies-in-waiting to the Queen Mother. And, of course, the Spencers had been intertwined with the royal family forever. She and Charles met at one of the Queen's was rather taken with Sarah, with her reddish hair and her outgoing sense of humor, and they began dating. After Sarah earned an invitation to Balmoral at the end of the summer, she reciprocated by asking the 28-year-old prince to a shooting weekend at Althorpe, the Spencer estate in Northamptonshire. On arrival at the house, Charles clapped eyes on Diana for the first time, who was then just 16 years old, tall and, and rather gangling. Diana, at the time, was probably too young to, you know, really impinge very seriously on his notice. But he made a huge impression on her. Diana thought how wonderful, how dashing, how handsome he seemed in the flesh. She'd been rather taken by him as a teenager. It's said that she had a picture of him on her school dormitory wall. Uh, I think she was rather struck by that first encounter. But for now, Diana was nothing more than his girlfriend's younger sister. And it was Sarah who joined Charles on a skiing trip to Closters in the February of 1978. To go on holiday with the Prince of Wales was quite a big step, and, and it did suggest that this romance possibly had legs. But on their return, Sarah made a huge mistake. In Closters, she became close to some British journalists. Back in England, at lunch with them, she had a far too frank conversation. She was being needled and about her romantic expectations and her past, and she blurted out that she'd had thousands of boyfriends and that when it came to marriage, she wouldn't marry someone she didn't love, were he the dustman or the king of England. She then realised what she'd done and phoned Charles to confess. He said, you've done a very stupid thing, and that was that. She was basically not just telling him that she didn't love him, she was Telling the whole world that she didn't love him, even though he was the king of future king of England. So I think that was quite embarrassing for him. As far as Charles was concerned, for his girlfriends to talk to the press was just about the worst thing that they could possibly do. Lady Sarah would eventually watch her younger sister marry Charles, but how would she have fared in Diana's place? I think she'd have been a much better match for Charles because Charles needed someone who's a bit stronger than Diana, and Sarah was that person. 
I like her honesty and her toughness. I wish that some of that boldness had transferred to Diana. Instead, Lady Sarah was happy to take the credit for Charles and Diana's union, calling herself Cupid. But it would be another three years before their relationship would begin. In the meantime, Charles would propose to two other women. Brie, dating a string of eligible young women. He's beautiful. Years earlier, he told the press he wanted to be happily married by the time he was 30. But as his big 3-0 approached, the pressure was on. Prince Charles's job was to get married and make babies. By the age of 30, he still hadn't done that. As Charles approaches his 30th birthday, there is this sense of panic setting in. He does throw himself into quite a few relationships. And he doesn't just throw himself into these relationships, he actually proposes um, to these different women. Over the next two years, Charles proposed to not one, but three young women. His next love interest, Amanda Natchbull, seemed to tick all the boxes. And more importantly, had the approval of Charles's romantic mentor, his great uncle, Lord Mountbatten. But that was hardly surprising. Amanda Natchbull was the granddaughter of Earl Mountbatten, and she was someone who he had known since uh, she had been a child, of course. She is also Prince Charles's second cousin. So with Lady Natchbull, he really kept it in the family. Charles was nine years older than Amanda. Was it pressure from Mountbatten that had once prompted the prince to speak to 16-year-old Amanda's mother about her being a future royal bride? Charles considered it from a very early age, but I think that Mountbatten had sown the seeds. I think Charles, the future king, was, as far as Mountbatten was concerned, he was a pawn. He was a pawn in the dynastic game, and he was a pawn that he hoped would go down the board and become a king, and that king would have as his queen, Amanda. I find that the most interesting of the relationships, not because it was emotionally intense on either of their part, it wasn't, but because Charles seemed so ready, so willing to consider a, a very young teenager as a possible bride, just, you know, because, because everyone told him he should do. Amanda Natchbull's mother, Lady Brabourne, was very wary. I think she sensed that Charles was casting around for someone who was suitable rather than someone who he was in love with. She told Charles to wait and see if a relationship developed. Over the next five years, Charles and Amanda did become close friends. But how suitable would she have been as a royal bride? Amanda Natchbull was descended from Queen Victoria. She was supremely aristocratic. She was virtually part of the family already. She knew the ropes, so from many points of view, she was absolutely ideal. I think he was very fond of her, and obviously they had a mutual closeness to Lord Mountbatten. He knew that they didn't fall in love at first sight. They weren't having sexy romps. This would be an old school merger, not a love marriage. In 1979, Charles did propose to 21-year-old Amanda. But despite pressure from Lord Mountbatten, it appears Amanda wasn't interested in becoming a royal bride. He did propose, and she was quite firm, and she didn't say, oh, I, thank you, how wonderful, I need time to think about it. She actually turned him down on the spot, but she did it with great elegance, and in it left no bad feelings. Amanda Natchbull turned Charles down, I think she just couldn't bear the thought of the exposure to uh, the pressures of, of monarchy. She doesn't see herself as a, as a future queen. As far as Charles was concerned, he was disappointed, but perhaps not that disappointed, because I don't think that the chemistry was really ever there as far as he was concerned. He was being a dutiful nephew as opposed to an ardent lover. Despite her aristocratic pedigree, Amanda went on to have a successful career as a social worker and advocate affordable housing. But had she accepted Charles's proposal, how different would the monarchy look? She would have been politicized, socially clued up, a reforming queen. She wouldn't have just traveled around wearing a tiara and amazing clothes. After Lady Amanda's rejection, it seems Charles didn't hang around, because shortly afterwards, he was seeing another heiress, 
Anna Wallace. She was the next in line, not to the throne, but the next in line to Prince Charles's bedroom. Interestingly, if you look at pictures, she looks, as someone once put it, like a more dangerous version of Lady Di. Well, it appears to be a full-on passionate romance. I would say they had a very hands-on relationship. Charles and Anna are said to have connected through a mutual love of country sports. But on paper, was Anna a strong contender for the role of royal bride? Anna Wallace was the daughter of a Scottish landowner. So in one sense, she looked really quite suitable. She was horse mad, hunting mad. Uh, she was known as Whiplash Wallace, apparently, for partly for her temper, her quick temper. She always rode higher and faster and longer than people on the hunt. Charles was very much taken with her for a brief while. The royal family don't tend to like women who have particularly strong personalities, so she might not have actually been a very good fit in the long term. In early 1980, Charles is said to have proposed to Whiplash Wallace. However, it's rumoured that Anna turned him down because his old flame was back on the scene. Camilla Parker Bowles. Marry Anna Wallace, or perhaps he was just pretty desperate full stop because he proposed to her twice. The thing is, it was obvious by this stage that Charles was in love with Camilla. Anna Wallace was the first of Charles's girlfriends to, as it were, have Camilla really shoved in her face. The Royal Opera House Covent Garden tonight. The formal climax of the Queen Mother's birthday with applause from 20 members of the royal family, dozens of peers... But it was at the Queen Mother's 80th birthday party, where both women had been invited, that the relationship turned sour. She was like a wallflower. He just ignored her the whole evening. And who did he ignore her for? He ignored her for Camilla. Charles and Camilla seem to have reignited their relationship at red heat, basically, and they weren't that discreet about it. Anna was furious, and she said to Charles, how dare you, I've never been so badly treated in my life. You've left me on my own, and now you can jolly well go on on your own without me. And that was the end of the relationship. And Anna was dispatched with a crack of the whip. Flash. After Anna's proposal was rejected, was it to be third time lucky for the Prince of Wales? In 1980, Charles was still grieving the loss of his mentor, Lord Mountbatten, who had been killed the previous year in an IRA bombing. He was staying at a friend's country house when he started chatting to a fellow guest, a 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer, the younger sister of his ex-girlfriend, Sarah. She famously spoke about how sad he'd looked at Mountbatten's funeral the previous autumn and how she'd been struck by it watching it on television. And I think it was that which struck a chord with Prince Charles. Diana seems very early to have considered herself as a suitable bride for Charles. She's quoted as once having said that, you know, she, had, she, she kept herself tidy on purpose. Diana herself says that that night his hands were all over her. But over the course of the summer of 1980, Charles set about pursuing her with gusto. There was a 12-year age gap between Charles and Diana. So what was it about this particular aristocrat that made her so suitable for the role of future queen? For the senior royals, Diana was an even better marriage prospect than her sister Sarah because she was younger. She hadn't had any boyfriends who were likely to talk to the press. She was from an ancient family with connections with the Churchills and with every other aristocratic family in the country. The Spencers and the royal family had been so close for Jen, part of the club. I think the palace and the courtiers thought she's not going to be any trouble. Oh, the irony. Once the press realised Charles was dating Lady Diana, they didn't leave her alone. Was it this, and pressure from his own family to marry, that prompted him to propose to Diana, reportedly after less than 15 dates? Is it any possibility of any announcements of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Please, help me. Please, please. Can you tell me if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Please. September 1980. They'd known each other no more than six weeks. They, they hadn't really seen a lot of each other. But the newspapers were already 
writing about her as this is the woman Prince of Wales will marry. As soon as the press and the media realized that they were seeing each other, they never left Diana alone. So there was this incredible pressure cooker atmosphere to the thing. All of the eyes of the world were on them. The amount of time they actually spent together from choice as two people getting to know each other and wanting to spend their lives together was absolutely minimal. Warning signs were there to see. On February the 24th, 1981, the Prince of Wales and Lady Diana Spencer officially announced their engagement. But four decades on, it's remembered for all the wrong reasons. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> but if it in love, do you? Yes. I mean, that means no, by the way. It was such a badly phrased answer, and, and definitely at the wrong time. And it sort of come back to haunt him, and it came back to haunt the pair of them for years and years. He was just trying to be clever. And of course, when you're trying to be clever to that extent, you turn out to be extremely stupid. And that's what he was. But if Charles was in love with anyone, was it with Camilla Parker Bowles? Whether or not he was still seeing Camilla romantically at this stage, it's clear that Diana saw her as a threat. All through the engagement, Camilla was a very powerful presence. Uh, it's only that Diana was a bit of an innocent that meant she didn't do anything about it. She suspected that Charles was still in love with Camilla, and there are all sorts of straws in the wind, telephone calls, uh, cufflinks with joined C's, Charles and Camilla, which aroused her suspicions. So from the very start, she felt deeply insecure. Famously, you know, her sisters said to her, you can't back out now, your face is on the tea towels. There is that sense of this huge public pressure to be letting down a whole nation if they backed out. But the nation did get their fairy tale wedding on July 29, 1981, when at the age of 32, the Prince of Wales married his 20-year-old virgin bride. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here was the dashing, handsome heir to the throne marrying a beautiful, blushing bride with impeccable pedigree. It was fairy tale like But behind the scenes, the reality was less satisfactory and Charles himself was already beginning to have terrible doubts. She was beginning to be eaten up by jealousy of Camilla. And so the fairy tale wedding, that was sort of Hansel and Gretel, sinister fairy tale, something much more dangerous to the future of the monarchy. As the fairy tale turned sour, Charles risked it all for the woman he loved. There was a poll in a major newspaper that said that between 80 to 90 percent of people felt that Prince Charles's behavior had significantly damaged the monarchy and would significantly damage it going forwards. At the start of the 1980s, as far as the world was concerned, Prince Charles had got his fairy tale princess, his happy ever after. Are you enjoying married life? Highly recommend it. And when William, and then Harry came along, their happiness seemed complete. However, shortly after Harry's birth, Charles and Diana's marriage began to crumble. At this stage, had an old friend already been lined up to pick up the pieces? He reached out to Camilla again as a source of comfort, and Camilla stepped in as a friend initially, for sure, to start with, to bolster his confidence. But at some stage, you know, they became, um, they became intimate again. Charles probably thought at that stage, well, lots of kings have had mistresses, I shall have a mistress, and that's what Camilla will be, and, and that will be very happy, and die will have to take it, but of course she wouldn't take it. Over the next few years, as Charles and Diana grew more distant, he and Camilla became closer. But it wasn't until 1992 that the royal couple announced their separation. 
with more and more damaging details about their personal lives hitting the headlines, including the infamous Camilla Gate tape. It was a full transcript of an alleged conversation between the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. As the reputation of the monarchy took a battering, it was clear most of the country was Team Die, and Charles and his mistress were vilified. The public were absolutely furious as the marriage of Charles and Diana broke down and they began to wash their dirty linen in public because people felt, and, and quite understandably, that Charles was in the wrong. There was a poll in a major newspaper at the time that said that between 80 to 90% of people who'd been consulted felt that Prince Charles's behavior had significantly damaged the monarchy and would significantly damage it going forwards. But it was clear that Charles was not prepared to give up Camilla. However, in 1997, a tragedy struck that shocked the world and shook the foundations of the monarchy. We have reports in Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Following the fallout from Diana's death, would it now prove impossible for Camilla ever to take her place by Charles's side? At one stage, um, after, after Diana died, Camilla didn't leave her house because she was so unpopular, she thought she'd be hissed and stoned and booed. They kept their heads down, but they kept faith with each other. And their relationship continued, and I think quite a lot of people eventually just thought, you know what, they clearly love each other. They're soulmates. There was a concerted effort, a very, very strong PR effort, to rehabilitate Camilla. And I think the change occurred, you know, it, it occurred over the years. In 1999, two years after Diana's death, Charles and Camilla made their first public appearance together. They're telling the world we're a couple, and you better accept it. Despite going public as a couple, why did Charles wait another six years before marrying the woman he'd loved for more than three decades? He's basically marrying his dead wife's nemesis. So I can understand why he was probably cautious about it, but I think they handled it very skillfully and very sensitively. And so when they were ready to get married, the public were not just key about it, the public actually were very warm towards the couple. What changed, of course, was his parents' intervention. They had been none too keen on Camilla for a long time, but there was a pressing argument that the Prince of Wales should have a wife because Charles could come to the throne with a mistress but no wife, and it would be quite difficult for him. Ceremony. As head of the Church of England, the Queen did not attend. But she and hundreds of other guests were at the blessing afterwards, held at St George's Chapel, Windsor. What was nice about it was the contrast between Prince Charles at his first wedding, which was something out of a sort of Disney movie with his Disney princess. This was so different. They looked really happy. They just looked like they belonged together. He'd finally got a ring on her finger and she was finally his wife. And it did feel like the whole country had come to the end of this most epic of romantic journeys. As far as Charles is concerned, Camilla is his perfect partner. But on paper, the divorcee Duchess is far from the perfect royal bride. So what will she bring to the monarchy? It's interesting because the question of a Queen Camilla would once have seemed utterly outrageous. But behind the scenes, it is said that Charles, understandably, wants his wife to be queen. It is perfectly apparent that Charles is at once happier and more stable, more forthcoming with her by his side. Camilla now, I think, is, is probably as close as you can get to being the perfect consort and perfect royal wife because she will never complain. She's very measured. Prince Charles' love life has certainly been colourful. He searched far and wide for the ideal bride. But had he followed his heart sooner, rather than his head, would his romantic journey have been completely different? The woman that Charles ultimately married and found true, lasting, mature happiness and friendship with. 
is exactly the type of person who, three decades earlier, he would have rejected immediately as queen. Charlie's angels, as they were called, I think they've been very important in making him realize that actually hunting for the perfect person is not a good idea because if you're actually out there desperately looking, you make mistakes, you try too hard. And so I think he's learned that the grass is not always greener and he was always better off with the first woman he loved anyway.